Dave, for that very enthusiastic uh, introduction. Hi, everybody. What's the crack? What's the crack? How are you? It's all right. Um, good. One person is good. That's fantastic. So um, I'm your I'm your final speaker, and I'm kind of the green chicken goosebumps have come out, so everybody is dying to happen. Um, but I want to thank you in advance for listening to my talk. So my name is Emer McGuire. Um, I am a science communicator. Has anybody heard of that job? Not really, no, I know I kind of made it up. Um, it's a job where you kind of talk about science to the general public and try and get them interested in it. And I do that by talking about science that's in the everyday and the science of things like music or the science of dancing. Um, basically, I didn't like science in school and I discovered it whenever I was at university and now I want people to like it as much as I do. Um, so David, you kind of hit on the first time that we met there. So I wanted to tell you a wee bit about how I got into science communication. So a couple of years ago, I was um, at uni and I was on Twitter and uh, I was just kind of scrolling through and I saw this competition called Fame Lab and I'd never heard of it but it was a science communication competition so it said it wanted you to go stand on a stage in Belfast and it wanted you to be able to explain a scientific concept in three minutes and it wanted you to be able to be clear so I thought I could speak clearly for three minutes and it wanted you to have good content and I thought well I'm okay at writing so I could probably write a three minute talk and it said you had to be charismatic, that was the third C. And my sister was there and I said to her, do you think I could be charismatic for three minutes? And she was like, not a chance. So <laughs> I was like, I'm going to prove you wrong. So I entered this competition and how you had to enter it was you had to send in a video of you talking about science for three minutes. And if you made it through that round, you got to go to this live final in Belfast. So the closing date was New Year's Eve, which I found incredibly inconvenient. But I had been putting it off, I'm not going to do it, I'm not going to do it. And I was like, I'm too shy, I don't want to video myself. But at that time, I was doing my Masters at Queen's in Anatomy, and it was all kind of about why monkeys can't talk, and I thought that was kind of an interesting topic. Plus, it was at a New Year's Eve party, and I got a wee bit brave, and it was about 11 o'clock, and I was all my friend, right, you video me talking about monkeys, right, I'm going to send it into this competition. So just before we got the taxi to the night out, I just recorded this really quick video and sent it off. Um, and I didn't hear anything for ages and I thought, well, I didn't get into that competition, but nobody knows because it was a video. So it doesn't matter. Like, nobody's going nobody's gonna to laugh at me, nobody's going to make fun of me. And then I um, actually got into the competition and had to go to the final in Belfast. So there were 10 people um, in the final. There was one other girl. Um, but I automatically thought she was smarter than me because she was from America and she was like over in some uni scholarship and everything. And then the, re the rest of them were guys. Um, so there were eight guys. And this was kind of their jobs. So there was a consultant from the Royal. Um, there was kind of someone who was doing chemistry as a PhD. There were biology lecturers. There were a couple of physics lecturers from Queens. And when we turned up in the night, um, we were all kind of talking about what, what scientific topic we were going to discuss. And they were saying, like, I'm going to talk about neutron stars, and I'm going to talk about how gold is formed in the galaxy, and I'm going to talk about biology. And I was thinking, I've really pitched this wrong, because I'm going to stand up and talk about the science of kissing. Um, and I was just like, I can't do this. And I went over to my mum, and I was saying, I'm, not, I'm actually not doing it. I don't want to do it. Um, and she was like, I have driven here from Strabane. Like, you are getting up on the stage and doing it. Uh, and I was like, I can't. And then David Mead was the host that night. And I went over to him and I was like, no, David, I don't think this is for me. Like, I can't do this. I can't do this. And I remember you were like, it'll be fine. You're going to be great. Just do it. Wise up. Just go. Just go. And I was like, right, well, if David Mead says I can do it, then I can do it. Um, <laughs> which is probably not a good model for life, David. But uh, I was like, I'm just going to do it. So I was up first. So I was like, I'm just going to get up, talk about kissing for three minutes, it'll be fine, it'll be all over. And I was so nervous, like I felt sick, I thought I was going to be sick, I was that nervous. And I'd never done any public speaking before. Um, but it was really, really, it was a really good night. And then um, I ended up winning the competition. Um, and I really found that whenever I was up on the stage, like I enjoyed it. And it wasn't as bad as I had thought it was going to be. But what people hadn't told me was if you won the Northern Ireland competition, you had to represent Northern Ireland in the UK. 
version <laughs> of the competition. So then I had the whole scenario again where I went to London and uh, that time I talked about the science of love and then I won the UK version of it and I thought if David Mead hadn't told me to wise up that night four years ago actually David um, in the black box in Belfast then I wouldn't be getting any of these opportunities. So it's kind of about having a wee bit of belief in yourself and your own abilities because before that night I did the first talk I never thought I would have been able to stand up in front of anyone. Um, and people always say to me, like, you probably aren't shy, you must never have been shy. Like, when I was wee, I loved singing. And one of my main memories of primary school is in P7, we all had to try out for the choir, and you had to sing Skip to My Lou. And I remember going up to the front of the class and standing, and I couldn't get anything out, and I just started crying in front of the whole class. And I was like, I can't do this. So that's the kind of person I was, you know, before I did that first talk. And from there, I got to do lots of cool things and had loads of cool opportunities. Like I got to do talks in lots of different places. Um, I've got to do quite a few TEDx talks. I got to do one in February actually, which was for two and a half thousand people. And it was such an amazing opportunity. Um, and then in 2017, I got to represent the UK in like an international science competition in Asia, in Kazakhstan, which was bizarre. Um, whenever we got there, we thought we were just going to do talks and we got there and they were like surprise it's a competition um, and then I won that as well so it was really amazing that I'd never kind of envisaged this as a career so I think if you can have a wee bit of confidence in yourself it's really really worthwhile um, got to do lots of cool things got to go on TV with Pam um, that's, my mom was like that's, that's the best that's ever happened according to my mom she's the only one my daughter was on Pam a while time what's your daughter about um, so, you know, I've got to kind of sing a storm that I go and talk in the news and BBC, and one of the best things is I've got to host, you know, present TV shows, with, or present radio shows with BBC, all about science, trying to get other people into science, so it's all kind of come from that. So, I thought it would be good for me to kind of talk to you about the science that I like, um, just as a bit of a talk today, now that you know what my journey has been and where I come from. So, the science that I like to talk about is sexy science, um, and people usually think, Science isn't that sexy. Like, it's not, it's not a sexy word. It is. I think it is sexy. Um, so the goal, of, you know, the goal of life is kind of the survival of our DNA as humans. We need to reproduce or else humankind would be extinct. And the way that we do that is through a really, really highly scientific process uh, called love. Um, is anybody here? Anybody here in love? <laughs> You're pointing at her? Who's she in love with? The boy beside her? Oh. It's just, for anyone who doesn't know who it is, it's the girl in the fourth row back, very, very red. Um, so I said again, whose hair is very red. Is there anyone else? Well, if any couples, put your hand up if you're here in a couple. You too? That's weird, she just didn't put your hand up when I said who's in love. Oh, that one. I did. You didn't see it. Right, okay. Um, so, love is quite an interesting thing. And whenever I was kind of learning about science or wanting to talk to people about science, I thought, I really didn't like science in school. I hated it. I thought it was quite boring. I want to get people excited about interest in science or science that everyone can relate to. Um, so, I discovered that kind of science splits love into three very distinct stages. So, I want to go through the journey of those stages with you today. So, the first stage is lust, okay? Um, so, at lust, you know, at puberty, two sex hormones become active in the body. You've got your estrogen and your testosterone. And from then on in, you're kind of constantly on the prowl, you know, <laughs> for somebody, somebody to reproduce it. Somebody just say yes. They're like, that's me, yes. Um, so I think that's fascinating because this has all been, you know, science has made us this way. Um, now, you know, we've got something called like an intimate eye contact, a copulatory eye contact. And if you make that with someone that you find attractive, say you see someone on a night out and you make intimate eye contact with them, that actually activates a very intimate part of the human brain, an animalistic part of the human brain. And it gives you two choices. So you can go towards that person or you can retreat away from them. Now, we humans are quite good with, with unrequited lust, but animals aren't so good. And if you look at this sweet cute fella here, um, if, he, if he approaches an unwilling female wolf spider, she doesn't just retreat away from him, she actually eats him. So see if you're rejected, like it could be much worse. I think that's all the time, we just like the spiders. 
So you have to think as well, what are we attracted to? There's so many things as humans that we're attracted to. But one of the main things is the colour red, okay? So is there anyone here wearing red? She's like, yeah, she is wearing red, okay, we know what she's here for. Uh, there's also, there's a guy here in kind of a more mulberry red who's trying to hide this. Do you two know each other? No? So what, um, millions of years ago, our ancestors developed this ability. He's actually looking to see who this is. He's like, lads, <laughs> like, lads, which, which one is it? So, millions of years ago, our ancestors developed this ability to see ripe red fruits amongst green leaves. So from then on in, within our brains, red equaled reward. And we've kind of been hardwired to think like that ever since. If you think of big brands, things like Coke and McDonald's, KFC, they all use red. And red's actually used to kind of quicken the pulse and cause feelings of excitement. Um, there's been quite a lot of studies that show how humans react to red. And there was one study in 2008 that showed that men will spend more money on dates if the woman is wearing red. Isn't that bizarre? There's another study that showed waitresses who wear red instead of white uh, get much higher tips. So that's a good tip for any budding waitresses in here. Um, so there's something else that we're attracted to, which is someone's scent. Do you ever really fancy someone you think they smell really good? Yeah, yeah. The first person I brought was like, <laughs> all the time. Um, <laughs> So it's like when someone smells really good, like when I walk past the Chinese, I'm like, it smells amazing. Um, but there is, there's something more scientific about it. So we've got something called the MHC genes. So it's like this group of genes, and they control our immune system, but they also give us our natural scent, but it's subconscious, you can't smell it. Um, and there's a really famous experiment where women overwhelmingly preferred the smell of t-shirts belonging to men who had the opposite MHC gene code to their own, and the reason for that is, if you were to reproduce with someone who has the opposite NHC genes, then your baby's immune system is going to get the best of both worlds, it's going to have a very varied immune system, and if you have a varied immune system, then your baby is going to be healthier and stronger, so in terms of genes, like opposites really, really do attract. And I think it's kind of weird, like if you're in a night out, dancing with someone, like your brain's trying to creepily kind of calculate your compatibility, like kind of snuff them, I just find that very odd. Um, so two people with opposite MHC genes will produce a baby who kind of has a bit of both. Um, so that's our stage one, lust complete. So we've got two more stages. So stage two is romantic attraction. So this is kind of the stage where you are madly in love with someone, like your head over heels, like Romeo and Juliet. Do you know that, that kind of stage of love? Um, you can't stop thinking about them. Um, and you just, you know, they're everything. Like, you love them so much. Um, and people kind of associate that with, with the heart, but the real magic of that stage of love happens in the brain. So there was a very, very famous experiment where scientists took people who said they were madly in love, and they put them in a big scanner. So they put them in a big MRI scanner. And they were able to see the parts of their brains that lit up. So there were a couple of parts. So there was a, an area of the brain called the caudate nucleus, which is an area that helps you expect and detect rewards. So the reward, if you're in love, is the love. So it lights up like mad if you fancy someone intensely. There's another area called the ventral tegmental area. And it acts like nearly like a chemical making factory, do you know? Um, it's nearly like your own personal cupid, so it makes all these chemical cocktails and it puts them into these wee arrows and it shoots them out all over your brains and your bodies. And the chemical cocktail is uh, made up of things like dopamine and oxytocin and serotonin blockers and they are really feel-good hormones. So those hormones, the really interesting thing about those is that they stimulate the same area of the brain as cocaine. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Yeah, it's got similar side effects, like things like increased heart rate and obsessive thoughts and ultimately addiction. So if you're in love with someone, you're actually just chemically insane. Um, but you know, like all drugs and things, your brain isn't able to survive and that's it. So it kind of has to sober up after a period of time, usually about three months for anyone who's kind of the start of a relationship here. Um, so your brain sobers up and these other chemicals kick in and they're kind of like pain killing opiate-like chemicals, and they take over, and they sober your brain up, and they bring you to stage three, which is attachment. Um, this is otherwise known as marriage. Um, are, there any, are there any married people? Um, 
How are you? Lovely, okay. Um, yeah, the married people are the people who usually put their hand up with the least enthusiasm in the room. Um, so your, your, brain, your body and your brain at this point release something called oxytocin, which I like to think of as a love hormone or the love glue. So in terms of evolution, that keeps you long enough with someone to raise a family, basically. And now I am, I'm one of the really lucky ones who has experienced love. Um, so I actually found my soulmate in a wee, wee coffee shop. It's like, you know one of those cool wee hipster coffee shops, one of those real wee niche ones? You probably haven't heard of it, it's called Starbucks. And um, <laughs> we fell in love in Belfast. And we just kind of hit it off. Um, we had all these private jokes, we just really, we just got on so well, do you know what I mean? Um, but the whole thing, like it wasn't mutual. Um, <laughs> Can you share this with me? Over the side of my broken heart. Um, so, uh, we both kind of got things from the relationship, you know, like I got this song, which is fantastic, um, and a restraining order, so... I think not enough songs have science in them, so I wanted to write a scientifically accurate love song for you guys. Hope you enjoy. Than actually admit it. 
Um, so I thought that it'd be a nice way to end to kind of tell you about one of the many times that I've fallen in love online. Um, is everyone here on Instagram? Yeah. So does anyone here know what an Insta Bay is? No? Oh my god, great. So an uh, Insta Bay is whenever it's whenever you see someone on Instagram and like you're kind of fifty or sixty or seventy weeks deep in their new feed and like you just think that's the one for me. <laughs> that's my soulmate. They're way better than the Brisa and Starbucks and you just think they looked amazing at their Auntie Karen's wedding three years ago, do you know? <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean. Um, so this is how I, I have loads of instincts, um, but you just think like their life is perfect. There's so many parallels between their life and your life, and if only they knew, you could be there in the bay as well. Um, and it's a very very common thing. I can't believe you haven't heard of it. It hasn't made it all the way to Porto Down yet, but uh, it and this bay is a great thing. And I thought I'll write a song about my insta bay. Um, hopefully someday my aunt today will we'll hear it and love me back. Um, but I just wanted to talk about uh, one aunt today in particular, where things didn't go quite how I would have, would have liked. Um, but I hope you enjoy this. We might need to turn my guitar down to this one because this song is much louder and more aggressive.
So, uh, Eamon, thank you so much for joining us and closing us out. Look, four years ago, could you ever have imagined that this would be, like, most of your job now? Uh, no, not at all. I didn't even know it was a job, so... Like I said, I genuinely kind of did it for the crack and because my sister was like, nah, no way. So, like, I'd be a wee bit competitive, that is why I did it. And then, after I did that first talk that night that you were there, like, I was still really, really nervous, but then I knew that I wanted to do it. And, um, yeah, I was the majority of my, my career. And, uh, I mean, do you think it was your sister, who clearly is obviously a pain in the hole, do, I mean, would, you, would you agree that... Like, do you think it's that that drove you on, or do you just think you always wanted to do this and didn't know what the meaning would be? Um, well, I've always really, really loved talking to people, and like I really love having the crack and stuff with my friends. Like I love taking a hand out of people, but I didn't know you could make it a job, do you know? Um, I don't know, right? <laughs> I know, well, then I saw you that night, and I was like, this is a job. I um, just you can do it, yeah. <laughs> So um, I didn't ever think I would be doing anything in science, to be honest, at school. Like, for my A-levels at school, like, I did English, psychology, and, and um, what else did I do? The other one was so unimportant, I can't do Oh, music. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, like I, did, I did PE and stuff. Like, I wanted to do sports or, or do music. Like, I, I never wanted to do science. And then when I went and did my, my degree in uni, I was like, oh, actually, science is good. Um, so I kind of fell in love with it then, and I, I like that I'm getting to combine science with having crack with people. And you've just had a sold out run in Edinburgh. How, yeah. how did it feel? It was amazing. It was really Like amazing. every single show was sold out. It's totally unheard of. Yeah. Like, it must have been terrifying. It was. It was really scary going over, actually, because I've never even been to the Friends to see it before. So I went over, um, and I was thinking, nobody's going to come to my show. It's going to be so embarrassing. And I was, the thing I was most worried about was my mum was coming over, one of the, I know, and like, if you imagine how much she complained about driving to Belfast or Shaban, I was like, she's going to go mental if she turns up to Edinburgh and there's nobody at this show. Um, so you have to go out and get flyers in the street now, saying to people like, oh, it's really good crack, like, it's really fun. And then like, all these people turned up and the show was sold out, like you said, and then people were being turned away and people were saying to me, oh, we came like, because you were so nice, it's such good crack on the street, and I was like, I didn't think you should turn up, but this is amazing. And I was just really surprised. And I was so happy the night that my, my mum came. That was probably the best night and the best kind of reception from people in the audience. So it was great. And I've never kind of done a... It was more of a comedy show. So I've never really done a kind of a pure comedy show with a little bit of science in it. Um, so it was brilliant. I can't believe it's so loud. I don't know why people came, but it was good. Um, <laughs> so you've got a new BBC show coming up, but you're also going to take your Edinburgh show back to Belfast, isn't that yeah. right? Over the course of when? When do you think? Um, it'll be in the next month or two, definitely. Um, so I'm, I might be doing it in September, but at, at the latest it'll be in October. And so if yeah. you follow uh, Emer on Twitter, Instagram, all of those things, you'll find out about it. I'm going to be there. I can't wait to see it. Folks, your big closing act. Let's hear it for Emer. Thank you so much.